This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. You're with James Finlay on Joy 94.9 for World AIDS Day. This special broadcast, broadcast around the world on, oh, on worldaidsdayworldwide.org. You can also get involved with the conversation we're going to have at uh, on air at joy.org.au and via Twitter if you use the hashtag JoyWAD. In this hour, we are exploring where are we headed with a focus on community leadership and political commitment. Our guests over the next hour include Adam Garner, who is the Global Advocacy Manager of the Global Network Living with HIV. And joining me in the studio is a very special guest. He is China's Goodwill Ambassador for UNAIDS. He's a, uh, as a journalist and now a news and business anchor for CCTV's English channel in China. He has interviewed people from Elton John to President Mugabe. I couldn't believe that, actually. Uh, well, uh, we'll explain that a little well, bit. Well, like, Elton John, Rob McGovern, they're not natural partners, are they? No, exactly, right? <laughs> and Annie Lennox. I feel like you guys are best friends. Um, not really, no, <laughs> but we could work on that afterwards. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, you have, uh, he has 1.6 million followers on Weibo. 1.7 now. 1.7 now? Yes. Oh my God, it must have gone up in the next, last couple of minutes. <laughs> uh, and his programs are broadcast to over 80 countries around the world, and as a result, is seen by 15 to 20 million people a day? Actually, now it's 85 million, and I apologize to every single one of them. 85 million a day? Well, you know, it's China. We have a lot of people. James Chow, welcome to Joy 94.9. Thank you, James. It's really uh, a pleasure not just to be in the studio with you, but for Joy to give us the space uh, for AIDS. I know you're a major partner of uh, World AIDS Day and, and, and also for Melbourne 2014. And in doing so, you... Uh, demonstrate what media everywhere should be doing in in supporting uh, people living with HIV, in supporting the critical awareness, and supporting the love and the kindness. I think that we all need if we're going to reach that AIDS free generation and to truly address the stigma and discrimination. The two very big words, but I think you know the love and the kindness is very very important. So thank you very much to you and to everyone at Joy. No worries. I've uh, I've. Uh, seen a lot of the work that you've done for uh, HIV and AIDS on on YouTube. It's, it's a lot of it everywhere. Actually, you've been around the world doing so much work, and I love that your key messages actually are love and kindness. Which mm. is it sounds so it sounds so simple, doesn't it? Mm. Yet still not there. You know, I grew up in a family with a lot of love and kindness, so I think that you uh, it becomes part of your spirit, becomes part of your DNA if you choose for it to uh, seep inside you yeah. it's always a choice the information and the examples uh, are not good enough unless you choose to pick what could work in your life and and, it, and allow yourself to uh, absorb in it but you know we were out just uh, now at government house yes. in melbourne and wow. we were listening to the person whom i think a lot of people have come here for uh, uh Aung san Suu Kyi, the uh, politician and what she said herself was that um, extend that love and kindness yeah. because you don't know when you'll need that love and kindness yourself and that when she was going through her own struggles uh, where she needed that love and kindness every day people from all over the world who may not even have heard of her country before mm. were able to give that love and kindness and so she therefore cord on each and every one of us in that room all of us being stakeholders equally in this fight uh, to do the same because I think James what you asked me is if you apply it to yourself and you said it's so simple and it is simple mm. love and kindness is free yeah. it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a gift it's beautiful but it's so hard for some people to do it you just need to think about yourself in the framework of it. You've got to think about people living with HIV, not as numbers, but as sons and daughters of people, sisters and brothers. And if we start seeing them as that, maybe we'll start seeing them more as our own family. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You um, you just uh, interviewed Aung San Suu Kyi, didn't you? Gosh, how do you know? That was only about I know, 45 like minutes, minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm all over it, James. Yeah. Uh, what how how is that for you as uh not just as a representative uh for uh, 
for youth even. Can I mm. still call you youth? You look youthful. No, I'm 35 actually. <laughs> and uh, but and and for China and as a UN um, ambassador and UN AIDS ambassador. But for someone who's such a political Journalist? heavyweight and yeah, Apart well for for uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, like, you know, she's. Uh, there are only going to be a few interviews in my life that I'm going to look back on anyway. And you remember certain ones for certain reasons, and you tend to remember the people who were always the most beautiful, the people who were so kind, the people whom you felt so truly honored just to be sitting opposite them and listening and learning from them. Uh, one of them, I would say, is Elton John. The other one, I would say, is our first lady in China because mm -hmm. she's been extraordinary in the AIDS response for many, many years and starting from when AIDS was so sensitive politically. Yeah. And today, um, I, I would find it very difficult to find one individual who could, could be more than that because... As so many people in Melbourne over the past couple of days have been saying today, your governor, when he introduced her last night when we were at a private dinner, she embodies uh, so much of where we hope to be in the world, whether we're talking about climate change or hunger or poverty or yeah. health or hatred. She is living proof that anything is possible. There were times for me when I felt so rejected for many different reasons and so out of the mainstream and so in pain for long periods of time and the depression was so extreme and I never felt that I belonged to anything or anybody apart from my parents of course I never really felt I belonged in school I never felt I belonged in my community I never belonged anywhere and I always used to think of Nelson Mandela. Mm. And I thought that if he could do it, an ordinary man, under extraordinary circumstances, in a community in a country which at that time was so awful, and at a time which was only 22 years ago, I just met with his former wife, Winnie Mandela, and I was reminded so much of the utter anger and hatred um, that apartheid brought Aung San Suu Kyi today says that people, you've got to think about how to come together because, how does she say it in a beautiful way? Because the people who want to take you apart, they know how to take you apart, but they don't know how to put you together. Mm -hmm. So I think that all of us know through AIDS uh, how to come <laughs> together. We're unified. We have to be. We are faced with stories and real people around us who live through extraordinary challenges through different times because of the AIDS response has changed. But really wrapping up that point, you know, I felt that when I came to AIDS, I felt that I found my family. Right. I felt that I finally belonged to somebody and that somebody belonged to me. And and that should I be so presumptuous to say that the people who belong to me together, all of us, are the 30 million plus, but also everybody else who is at risk. It's not just the people who are positive, but everybody who is in a key affected population, whether it be the injecting drug users, the men who are sex with men, it all sounds, the, these are terms, these are terminology, but all these people, we're all people, we're yep. all men and women and boys and girls. And I feel so allied to this. Mm -hmm. It's actually an interesting point that you just brought up because I was actually wondering what exactly was the the first thing that took you to uh, to HIV and becoming an activist because I I'd imagine in China things are a little bit mm, different different thank That's you a very nice way of putting it <laughs> I think everybody outside is probably laughing by now. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, things are a little things bit different. Things are very I different. I mean, you have so many people there for a start. Now we're at 1.3 billion plus. We've gone through extraordinary political chapters. Um, and, and you know, look at where it is now, the second biggest economy. It's not just about money. It's about what that economy can do for people once the wealth is distributed. Um, I think that is um, 
that's part of the reason why the framework of of this is different and you know it was being in china and working there that really showed me and brought me into aids there was first of all the sars outbreak and i saw as a reporter and a journalist how people get very scared when they don't know about something and when miseducation come filtering through the media like you and me yeah. and you see that fear grip people when they are submerged in the unknown so latterly i went on to aids it was a, a meandering path towards it um but at the end of the day i came to it through my health journalism my experience through the sars uh, through bird flu funny enough it brought me into uh, a lot of that world but when somebody approached me and asked me do you want to advocate uh, this this cause this fight the one thing that grabbed me wasn't really the health aspect ironically it was the hatred that i was hearing about the rejection from families from parents and brothers and sisters from jobs companies not even see discrimination doesn't need to be a word doesn't need to be uh, a bad word even it can be dismissing you in my mind mm. or just passing you up quietly for a promotion um ignoring you saying something about you behind your back or saying something about you inside of me that no one else can hear and we're all accountable to each other so it's that stigma and discrimination that brought me to them and with 1.3 billion people in this country um perhaps it's even more so why one needs to be allied with the cause of humanity because there is s the most number of and the biggest chunk of the human family living in one space there mm, yeah uh we've got uh adam garner connected to us uh, via video link uh <coughs> who is from the global network living with hiv hello adam how are you uh good morning or good afternoon how are you doing <laughs> good thanks yes it is good morning for you isn't it you just woke up i've just said quite an early but the sun isn't even up yet yes yes <coughs> and it must be very cold as well it is quite chilly but luckily i'm indoors so it's fine okay fantastic <laughs> um can we can we just uh we're just talking about how james first got involved with uh, advocacy for hiv um how how did you first start um so around 10 years ago, I was, um, I, I volunteered um, with an organization called VSO um, in Zambia. Um, and I started being a maths teacher um, in a very, very rural village in northwestern province of Zambia. Um, and quite quickly, I noticed that um, the problem wasn't um, a lack of math teachers, but um, of HIV programs for young, young people. Specifically, so I, I kind of grew into HIV prevention work, um, and I spent like two and a half years, three years doing doing that work in Zambia. Um, and then, ironically, on my my last day in Zambia, I I got drunk because I was leaving a country that I loved. Yeah. Um, I ended up um, in bed with a <laughs> a woman I had never met before, and ended up contracting HIV. Um, so. I came I came into the HIV HIV world in a a bizarre route, a non orthodox route, um, and and then since then I I kind of uh, had a, a personal commitment, but also because of my previous history working in Zambia and seeing the epicenter of the epidemic, seeing where people are dying, friends and family and people I taught were being were dying left, right and centre. Mm -hmm. It's um, it has quite a a humbling and um, sobering effect on you. Yeah. Can you tell us about uh, some of the work that the Global Network Living with HIV does? Yeah, sure. So um, GMP Plus, or the Global Network of People Living with HIV, we um, we are the only global network of all people living with HIV um, around the world. And it's our responsibility or mandate, if you like, to um, to ensure the greater involvement of of people living with HIV in all processes, um, in all political decision making processes, um, in UN systems, in in the global fund, um, so wherever there's a decision that needs to be made, or a piece of programming that needs to be designed, or um, an intervention that needs to be planned for, 
people living with HIV should be involved. Um, and GNP Plus is um, advocates for, for that involvement. Um, and we also, um, through our work, we will support national networks of people living with HIV and strengthen them, um, both in their organisational capacity, but also in the advocacy that they do at the national level. Yeah. Um, so a lot of my work is is with the UN system and the global fund and um, inter international agencies and organisations. Right, James, uh, can you tell me a little bit about how uh, how China reacted or how maybe your viewers reacted when you started your HIV um, awareness? I think I probably kept it very quiet in the beginning. I did um, because I don't have secrets from anybody, least of all for the people yeah. uh, for whom I work. I think that I owe them that much. Um, but I I didn't really reveal too much about the AIDS work I was doing. And it was mostly through the UN, and I did some through civil society at that time. Yeah. I learned a lot. I say when I worked, I probably went there and just listened and, and tried to find a way through. These were leaders they were demonstrating leadership. I knew how to read the news on television, but this was completely new and uncharted territory for me. So I went and listened more and, and I started doing some things. But later on, uh, when I was appointed a Goodwill Ambassador, I think that was uh, for the work I'd already done, but also uh, looking ahead, I think they thought I could bring aid to China through uh, television, now through social media and, and so on and so forth. Uh, through moderating panels and 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 to to going on these trips, um, they were so supportive. So when I got that letter saying that they were going to appoint me as a goodwill ambassador, I went up to the office and came clean, <laughs> <laughs> and I told them that this was what, what was going to happen. I showed them the letter, and you see this extraordinary response from people, whom you didn't really even know in the office. And I always said to myself, this was the one thing I was going to do. That would not be to advance my career, myself, you know, yep. all this, all this. And I would keep it so precious uh, because it was so pure and naive almost. And I think everybody knew that. And so, you know, they're so helpful in the office. You know, anybody who wants to help with editing or doing this or doing that or making some connections or... And you can see the way people react to it because they know it's true. They know that that's the only reason why you want to do it. It's because it's a people thing. There's nothing beyond that. It was just so simple. And they're the same today. I mean, they're really, really supportive. And, you know, even coming to Melbourne, for example, of course, I had to rearrange a studio days and someone else goes and anchors the news. And yeah, they yeah. show that extraordinary support in ways that only they can. And I think not many companies would actually do the same and also they've been incredible in giving us so much time airtime mm -hmm. and so much money uh to hire for live satellites camera crews and we have some here in melbourne as well mm. uh and and but most importantly it's not about money the best thing that they can do is give me space and that space for people living with hiv and people representing them or people and scientists or civil society or researchers uh, to be able to talk because i just think that we don't hear enough about it and we hear so much about what arts have done which is fabulous but there are so many people who don't have the access to the drugs yet we keep on talking about testing but as someone rightly pointed out to me what's the point of knowing your status if i have no access to the drugs so i think that we all have our journey that we all have this extraordinary uh duty to play and adam uh, it's nice to meet you i'm james uh, just hearing your story and you know i think the best thing that each of us can be is to be a, a servant to other people and to truly give our lives to to something which is going to be much much bigger than you and all the people around you and i think it doesn't have to be about being a television presenter or 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 or, or even doing what Adam does, which is uh, extraordinary uh, on, on an everyday basis, of course. I think even if you just go and talk about it mm. in your office, in your home, in your communities, even to that one person um, <coughs> about safe sex, about good choices, um, about people you know, about experiences, I think that in itself is, is, is wonderful. And as you said, it's just still love and kindness as well, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, you brought up uh, how supportive your company was. Mm. Is that typical for Chinese companies? Well, that's a great thing about being state run because we don't <laughs> have this, you know, you know, that's a really great thing because they have this agenda, which is to cover major um, uh, humanitarian issues. And also, you know, when we, for example, one face of the AIDS response, apart from, I always say the most important people are people living with HIV. It's their future. It's their voice. Everyone has a voice. You just have to listen. Mm. Another critical aspect of it, though, is political leadership. And of course, being a state run television channel, you want to have political leaders speaking on your program so i think kevin rudd came on before julie bishop came on before um uh you know we've had um, any number of prime ministers and presidents and they i've got every single one to talk about hiv because i think it lends a gravitas it means that if they can talk about it so can you yeah it keeps it somehow on the political agenda and for the company itself it's a big name if you look at it that way for a news channel we're, we're not an HIV AIDS channel we're, we're a political channel primarily and so that's another way in AIDS yeah. being the entry point because AIDS is much bigger than just uh, a health it's, it's about the rights issues it's about uh, the access to basic services about poverty it's about gender women girls sexual violence transgender it touches the most fragile parts of us and when you fix this you are actually fixing um the soul of the human family mm -hmm. uh just quickly you also mentioned uh i think you said why why bother getting tested if i can't have access mm. to drugs is that a, a problem in china not uh, not in china i think in in china actually um this is this is you know this is this is the the, the good thing you know you can get free free treatment mm. uh free treatment there are certain uh markers around that meaning that your uh, c4 has to be below a certain level so there needs to be a, a quote unquote qualification level uh -huh. the other thing though that's stopping people getting treatment access to treatment in china is not the money issue it's a logistical one. So, for example, say you have a residency card. Everybody has a residency card. So, James, where are you from? Where were you born? Mm -hmm. Where, where oh, were you born? Uh, uh, Melbourne, actually. Melbourne. Yeah. Okay. So, your residency card will be attached to the state of Victoria. Mm -hmm. If you then go to Sydney to go and work, you would need to go back to the state or province listed on your residency card in order to access really? that free treatment. And you know, China's a big place, yeah. you know. You might need a day or two days just to go to get, get back home on a train. Uh, your 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 employer would want to know where are you going. That would raise a lot of questions. <laughs> People talk a lot. And uh, you would need the money to go back home. It's not cheap. And so it does raise that logistical red tape bureaucratic issue. But also, so many of my friends in China tell me that, uh, for example, they have a flu. So they go to the hospital for some medication. They would say, because of your health status, you need to go to the infectious diseases hospital. But they're not going there to be treated for their infectious disease. Mm. That's what I just don't understand. So it's really the stigma and discrimination also from frontline medical workers. And this is where it comes back to, James. It's not really just the education which everyone talks about. It's really about changing something inside your heart. Yeah. Because for all the education in the world, and doctors and nurses would know all the medical, the science, the proof, the evidence, the only reason that's blocking them and blocking themselves from people living with HIV and doing their job is because they 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 block something inside their heart and they don't allow that to flow through. Yeah, yeah. I'm joined with uh, CCTV uh, anchor, journalist, and uh, let's just say Chinese major celebrity. Oh, uh, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> James Chow and also Adam Garner from the Global Advocacy... Uh, uh, well, the Global network living with hiv uh on joy 94.9 uh you can get involved with our conversation at uh, on air at joy.org.au and also via twitter you can tweet using the hashtag joy w a d i'm james finlay and i'll see you right after these messages this is world aids day worldwide this is world aids day worldwide you're with James Finlay here on Joy 94.9 for a special World AIDS Day broadcast. Also uh, uh, on the internet at world, uh, worldaidsdayworldwide.org. You can 
see me, you can see our beautiful guest, James Chow, and you can also see Adam Garner, I think. Uh, so get on that. But you can say... Oh, you? Adam, we were Googling pictures, yeah. but we couldn't find one, so if you can send one to us. <laughs> yeah, so, so, oh, I, think, I think they can see him on Skype, but we don't have that facility in okay. the old. Yeah, community. Oh, really? You can see him, okay? <laughs> um, so, yes, if you want to get involved in the conversation, you can uh, <coughs> on air at joy.org.au and also via Twitter. Just use the hashtag joywad. Uh, Are you using that, James, on your Twitter? Uh, you're tweeting now. Are you using that hashtag? I, I, I was just sending an email to Michelle City Bay because he says, can you send me a number? I want to call. I'm leaving now. And I'm saying, actually, I'm a little bit too busy because I'm talking to James Finley on the radio. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sure Michelle is all over it. You know? He's amazing. Extraordinary. <laughs> he is amazing. Uh, a fighter for people, a, a fighter for every one of us. Mm. Uh, uh, Adam, let's cross over to you. Uh, you uh, uh, yeah. quite open about your um, HIV status. Can you uh, maybe tell us a little about how it, uh, how different it is living uh, as an HIV positive man in Europe um, uh, as opposed to living in Africa? Um, yeah, well, uh, um, <clears throat> I can try. I think the one of the major things that pushed me into uh, continuing work in HIV after I was diagnosed was um, was the inequality. Um, the fact that I, I still knew friends, um, as I said, um, in Zambia who had been diagnosed, who had the same words come out of the doctor's mouth, um, you're living with HIV, and that for them it was still a death sentence. Access to treatment back in 2004, 2005 was um, unheard of, specific, especially where I was working. So um, that, that strikes quite a hard core when you know that just because I was born um, in the United Kingdom and I have access to um, one of the best health, surf health services in the world, um, I, I get to live and other people who are my friends, my colleagues, um, my pupils, as I said, um, they get to die. Um, and that that's the kind of thing that, that really spurred me on to, to continue working because that, that kind of inequality is um, just shocking. Um, so I think it is the access. I think uh, James was talking a little bit about some of those access issues in China, and I think that sort of they, they, um, those barriers exist all over the world and and it's it's not just about um the distances people have to travel but it's also about the priorities people have to make in their lives and the choices because in some countries if you're you some people are having to make the choice between having treatment for a month or or eating or sending your child to school for a month and the fact that the medication in some in some countries is so so exorbitantly expensive um it's it literally about eating or taking treatment, and obviously the the, the immediate need is is food um, and shelter, and therefore um, people are not going on treatment when they should. So um, it's it's about equity and it's about access. It's um, that still gets me out of bed in the morning, even on a Sunday morning at mm. five thirty, mm. um, and and it will continue to do so until there's there's real change in terms of people around the world having access to treatment when they, when they need it. Is, is that one of the <coughs> things that is bringing you to uh, AIDS 2014 as well? Um, yeah, it's one of the many things. I think um, treatment um, is a, in the last two or three years, has been a, a massive game changer. People, you know, all, the, all the UN, the heads of the UN keep talking about game changers, but this really is, the fact that we, we're now using treatment and we're putting people or offering people like myself and, and others um, access to treatment and knowing that, that that has a preventive benefit so it means that it can actually stop new infections to other people is a, is a massive, a, a massive um, bit of news, essentially. It's, it's re it really is news. And the fact that... We now, if if we do it properly and scale up access treatment effectively, then we're going to have a massive impact on the way in which um, new infections are arising and and um, prevalence rates. This, this this is the kind of turning point in the HIV response, and the community, people living with HIV, have a massive role to play. Not only if if they're taking their treatment themselves or accessing treatment, but also in the way in which treatment's delivered. 
So um, not everyone is able to access treatment from a, um, a primary health care facility, from a, a hospital or from a clinic or from a, um, I don't know, from a doctor's surgery. So finding out where people are, are most likely to access their treatment from, where they feel most comfortable, um, and decentralizing treatment access is, is probably one of the most critical things we can be doing to get pe get uh, as many people on treatment as soon as possible. Mm. Uh, I was just going to say that, you know, I interviewed Michelle <clears throat> for television yesterday and you know went through all the questions and cover the different areas of our work at UNAIDS but he stopped and he made a point he said you've got to ask me about treatment that we've made huge progress on treatment but 80 million people are still waiting for it yeah. so he did make this an, a, a very very strong point and he did so again at all at all his public calls here today I know that it's not just uh, something that he says outside but he talks about it to us all the time and keeps on saying exactly what Adam said. You cannot afford to take your foot off that pedal because if we keep it on, there is the opportunity to accelerate this response. But if we take it off, it would not only not accelerate, it could actually just falter. Yeah. I, I was talking to uh, Manwe Dalawell uh, earlier today from the UNDP uh, about the criminalization of, of drugs as well and that you know the new emerging drugs are not being... Oh, they're not easily accessible because they're so expensive and because there's so many laws around the uh, the you know, keeping what the formulas are, you know, a secret from the, the cheaper drug companies and uh, the... Oh, what is it? <laughs> the patent laws. So, sorry, go? The intellectual property. The yeah, thank law. you. The patent laws, the intellectual property laws. And that there was a another... There's a whole nother issue in that as well. And, you know, if if people don't have access to cheaper drugs, like the, you know, the, the poorer countries or whatever, then it's, it's going to add to the, the gap that we have between, you know, people getting medication and people not getting medication. That rich and poor and that north and south exactly. uh, divide that we have over here. I was just listening to you and, and I was listening to Adam and I was thinking it it is... Uh, an epidemic that can be treated uh, we we do know that but it's so complicated and it throws up the most extraordinary discussions uh, here the three of us are talking me from china visiting you just back in melbourne mm -hmm. and adam over in uh, amsterdam but linked to london also to zambia i think you said adam and it's extraordinary that aids has only aids has that capacity to bring people from three different areas and three different life journeys together and to discuss some very, very complex issues. Yeah, it's, I, I think it is one of those topics in the world that, of course, can, connects people. And I think it can only get better, you know, over the, the next, over the few coming years because it's one of those, uh, those areas that is getting greater awareness, more understanding and slowly less stigma yeah yeah i think i'm being very positive yeah this, you know? <laughs> no, yeah sorry adam no i was going to say i think the the challenge as james says it's very it is very complicated and um especially when we talk now about scaling up treatment the challenge is is how we do that in a way which is sensitive to the people people who need treatments needs i think that there is a risk that what's going to happen because we do have the science um, we have all the research, we have all the evidence that suggests that putting people on treatment is, um, is good for not only their, their health, but also um, good for prevention. Um, there is a risk that people are going to start getting forced to take treatment. And I think that this, is, this is the risk we now, have, we, we now face. I think this is a challenge. How are we going to scale up these things in a way which is sensitive to the human rights of, of people living with HIV? And also, how are we going to reach the, the communities um, which, are, um, which are most in need, most marginalized, which are most underserved, um, which would pro probably um, really require some very innovative and interesting types of in interventions to actually get access to them? Because um, currently, I think that's where we're failing. The, the easy to reach 
are being reached. It's now really how how do we find how do we find those those communities which are on the the edges of of society that just don't get um, just don't get looked at by by everyday programs. Um, I think that's our next big challenge because I think reaching some of the targets which are being set by the UN and I think post 2015 that agenda is um, is going to be very interesting as it as it rolls out. But some of these targets are are always going to be un, unattainable if we don't um, if we don't reach key populations. We don't reach sex workers living with HIV. If we don't reach um, people who use drugs. We don't use, reach transgender people. And we don't reach MSM. It's um, it's an uphill battle, or is that a mixed metaphor? But <laughs> you know what I mean. You mentioned um, the the healthcare uh, being born in in London, Adam, and and it made me think about how unfair and unjust it is that your access to medication, not just to uh, antiretrovirals, but your 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 opportunity for health care in general is still largely dictated by where you happen to be born in the world. <clears throat> uh, that's still one thought that keeps going through my head. And you mentioned there about post-2015 uh, when the Millennium Development Goal targets are due to be met. And I was in Bangkok at the ICAP meeting, the Asia-Pacific version of the AIDS Congress, uh, about a week ago. And um, there are only about 800 days till we have to meet those MDGs, and AIDS, rightly, I think, has its own MDG at MDG 6. What happens after that will be the sustainable development goals, and it's going to be rather different. It's not just going to be about the developing world and largely around poverty and, and AIDS and very, very closely linked issues, but it's going to be thrown wide open, climate change, education, health will just be one of them. And within health, of course, we have so many critical challenges. And it's by no means limited to the developing world, but also the developed world, and will reflect the shifting dynamics that we've seen geopolitically with the emerging nations and also this economic slowdown that we've all felt in some way and that just uh, doesn't go away. So I think that what's worrying is that with 800 days left to address the MDGs, there are only about 200 days to make sure that AIDS does stay on the SDG agenda when the first draft of that comes out in New York during the UN General Assembly in September. So I know what UNA is and what Michelle's been trying to do it's a very, very personal movement for him is that he uh, constructed what's called the UNAIDS Lancet Commission. It's not just another commission because a lot of these commissions are like that. But he's brought on people who are allied to AIDS, serving politicians, presidents, heads of state, but also civil society and brought them all together. And he wants all of us to work tirelessly until September. That means leveraging our personal and our professional networks, people that we can reach, people who can make a difference in the international community to make sure that AIDS doesn't only just stay up there, but actually is still very much front and center. And I don't, James, I hope you don't mind me asking, but I just wanted to ask uh, you, Adam, I, I'm, I am just a communicator and I'm just a platform. And no matter how much my heart is tied to uh, HIV AIDS and the people and my friends who happen to be positive, I still always feel that I'm I'm still a tourist to it all mm. and that uh, the people living with HIV, um, it's, it's always uh, those friends of mine who I want to listen to. So I just wanted to ask you, what is it that you want everybody to know and what is it that all of us can do in our different ways? In, in 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 relation to the sustainable development goals, or in, in, in relation general? to to anything, I mean anything that's on oh, your heart and on your I, mind. I um actually right at the beginning of the show when you mentioned um the what people can do and you you uh, this this program is going out to kind of general public, which is amazing. So we have quite a a broad range of people listening. I hope, mm -hmm. and I think the. When I was first diagnosed, um, and every World AIDS Day, I would think of something else new and wonderful to do on World AIDS Day that would get my friends involved, people who generally wouldn't be interested in HIV. And and I would always post something on Facebook or, or send emails out to all my friends saying, I know that HIV is a difficult thing for you to talk about because you it doesn't really enter into your life or so you don't think. Um, but if you're able to do anything today, just go to a bar and 15 minutes, just have one conversation with one other person about HIV. It can be in what, in relation to anything else, but just mention HIV. And just that very, very small thing, I think 
we're still in a we're still in an age where no one is no one is really talking about HIV and they, unless they really have to, unless they're involved in the response or unless they're directly affected by HIV, people are still not talking about it. And stigma and discrimination are are still life. Stigma and discrimination is still probably one of the biggest challenges we have in terms of universal access. And and we're never going to see the political commitments we need um, in relation to HIV unless there is a groundswell from general public who, who actually talk about HIV. So I think those very, very small seeds of, um, of asking a, your friend, asking your neighbour, just spending 10 minutes in an otherwise banal conversation about football, talk about HIV, talk about infection rates, talking about anything you like, but mention HIV and AIDS, and I think, and it will, it'll slowly have a, a, a I think, a massive effect. I think it, it gets HIV back on people's consciousness, mm -hmm. and and then it'll slowly, uh, hopefully, um, have an effect and um, an impact on, on political leadership as well. Yeah, and people are getting involved uh, via the internet using the hashtag uh, JoyWAG and on email, on air at joy.org.au. And uh, we've uh, got, and I think one of the questions that has come in and has just been answered by you, actually, Adam, it says, uh, what can we do as lay people to make sure that HIV stays on the agenda for SDG, MDG? Um, and I think maybe keeping the conversation open might be one of those, right, Adam? Yeah, I think so. I think there's obviously um, so so many of these these types of initiatives where uh, on World AIDS Day we're often speaking to the converted. We're preaching to the people who understand HIV, who know the, the epi epidemiology, who know the statistics, and uh, and therefore the effect is often quite minimal because we're, we're speaking to the people we don't need to be speaking to. Um, the great thing about this show is that we're speaking to people who might not always be hearing this kind of information, you might not be hearing about HIV on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, it, it is about starting very small and and raising the co public consciousness again about HIV. When it was high back in the 1980s and 1990s, there was a, a sense of urgency about, about doing something about HIV. That sense of urgency shouldn't have gone away. Um, the fact that we're doing amazing things with treatment and the fact that we're saving so many people's lives and the fact that we're averting so many new infections is great but that sense of urgency is still the same we still, still should be um as interested in stopping <laughs> the the progress of this disease as we were in in 90 in the 1980s yeah. that shouldn't have gone away so i think if we can sustain that we'll be we'll be doing well we we're going to have to close soon which is a shame because we could nearly talk about this all day well actually this station is talking about this for 24 hours but uh D James uh, what uh, you how long are you in Melbourne for I'm in Melbourne until Tuesday. Okay. I've never been here, so I wanted to You've spend a little bit. You've never been to Melbourne before? Never. I'd only been to Sydney before, and it was only because of AIDS right. two years ago. So see how AIDS brings you to places you've never been to before. But I, I would also say um, talk to people about sex because it demystifies it, especially in very uh, quote-unquote traditional cultures, and 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 talk about it in a way that's useful. I, I, someone asked me before uh, on in a radio interview, what what can we do for AIDS? Can we raise some money? Can we volunteer? I said, well, it's not about that. I said, I said, just go back home and talk to your children about safe sex before they find about it, find out about it, uh, not accurately probably from their school friends who know about as much as they do yeah and i said would you rather the embarrassment or would you rather something else because once you make uh, once there's one decision which probably isn't the best then it takes you onto another branch on that tree of life and he said to me but you know you know in asia we don't talk about sex and you know in, in china we don't talk about sex i said really i said that's interesting because there are 1.3 billion people there so someone is having sex Exactly. Someone is having sex, and even I would if say they're only allowed to, well, were only allowed to have one child, right? One child, but then they're condoms. Yeah, that's um, right. very, very quickly. The SDGs, the MDGs. I would say, call on your political leaders. It goes back to exactly what Adam said over there, which is having a people movement. I think we had that back in the eighties. We keep on talking about innovation as if it has to be an iPhone app or it has to be something that's yet to be invented, but 
don't forget, innovation doesn't need to be totally original. It can be a take on an existing idea. And secondly, how much have we innovated and transformed the world through AIDS over 30 years? That we can have 30-something million people living with HIV is still a step of progression beyond what could otherwise have been more than 30 million people in addition to the 30 million who died. And just very, very quickly, uh, talking about the leadership Political leaders do listen when you demand. They demand because they're there because you elected them into those positions. So go out there, go out. And, you know, we saw those pictures back in the 1980s of people taking to the streets because people were dying everywhere and it was an emergency. And, you know, Adam, you know what you said? I think it's still an emergency. Someone said to me last week, well, it's not an emergency anymore. It's an epidemic. I said it's an emergency if one people or one person is still getting infected. So yeah. call on them because people do listen to people. You just need to be focused. You need to know exactly what you want and you need to get right to that person and keep on doing it. Don't do it once, don't do it twice because people start believing you and they start taking you seriously and start thinking you're credible when they keep on hearing that same consistent message that didn't change because you believe in it. Thank you, James Chow, for joining us for the last hour. And thank you, Adam, as well, all the way from Amsterdam. Uh, all the best for the AIDS 2014 conference, where this conversation, where are we headed, will be continued when the conference comes to Melbourne next year. In the next hour, join Beck Savick as she celebrates Joy's 20th birthday with Joy's uh, President Jed Gilbert and GM Conrad Brown, among other guests. So next hour will be a little bit lighter, so that'll be fun, because it is Joy's 20th birthday, James. Did today? You know? Yeah, today. Today? Today. On World AIDS Day? Exactly. By coincidence? No! Not oh, not by coincidence. <laughs> oh, okay, so that was a strategy. It was a little uh, bit of a strategy. Oh, I'm, I'm from television, <laughs> so, you know, I'm not, not so quick up in, in yeah. the mind. But we will see you again in Melbourne 2014 in seven months from now, won't Most we? Most definitely. Will you be here? I'll be here. Adam, are you coming? Yes, indeed, I'll be Great. there. Great. We can, we can all... We should do this in the same again. room. We can, we can redo <laughs> this, you know? We can do it. Uh, I'm James Finlay, and I'll be back at 1am if you're still going to be awake when I discuss youth issues surrounding HIV and AIDS. Uh, but uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, James. Enjoy the rest of your time in Melbourne. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, James. Thanks, Joy. Adam, we can't wait to meet you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Have a great day. Uh, I'm James Finlay. I'll see you at 1am. You're listening to Joy 94.9.